Okay, hello together. I'm Johannes from Typefox, and today we want to investigate together from a developer's point of view how we can uh, combine and develop uh, domain specific uh, languages and how we can work to, uh, with them in our usual uh, daily software development processes. If you are already an experienced language engineer or even build workbenches for language, for DSLs, uh, takes this presentation to think about how we can improve the language workbenches uh, fr from the point of view of a, let's say, usual developer, and how to allow the borders to come into that. So uh, domain-specific languages have the objective to support um, users uh, and to enable users to formalize their knowledge without the need uh, to be able to write uh, general purpose programming languages. So you, that you can formalize your knowledge without using uh, programming and development skills. So we have uh, lots of examples for such DSLs. You all know uh, mathematical expressions in MATLAB or the typical formulas in your spreadsheets. Um, there are often formal specifications when you develop uh, hardware. If for example, when you want to uh, uh, formalize what your hardware needs to do with test cases. Um, you can specify document markups with languages like LaTeX and Markdown. And uh, these examples are textual languages, but they are also graphical languages, graphical DSLs, for example, to um, model activities and workflow, like for the business process modeling notation, or you all know in gun charts. There are, of course, DSLs also which are used by developers. I named only a few examples. CSS, SQL, um, are graphical DSLs for developers. There's also, for example, uh, lots of UML uh, diagrams which, are, which can be seen as graphical DSLs as well. So uh, summarizing that in a big picture, we mainly have two actors. We have the users, which are our domain um, experts. They you might have um, developer skills, but usually they are unexperienced and are non-developers. We want to support them uh, with, oh, sorry, with, um, uh, with uh, smart editor support uh, to enable them to formalize their knowledge. And we as developers, uh, we use, take the role of language engineers. We need to provide these smart editors for them with DSL definitions. And of course, these uh, DSLs uh, are not a purpose for themselves. We need to work with a formalized knowledge. For example, we write generators to generate artifacts to persist this information in databases. Uh, or to um, provide this information in our business technology. So usually we have an integ integration of DSL editors and in our system landscape. Um, and the next po point, language and uh, our language workbenches. We as developers like to use language workbenches because they help us to easily develop uh, DSLs. So I. Um, provided some examples. For example, to develop textual DSLs, you can use Langium or Xtext. Um, graphical DSLs uh, can be developed with Sirius uh, Desktop and Web or the graphical modeling framework. There are also uh, workbenches like JetBrains um, MPS, which support uh, graphical and uh, textual DSLs and tables and formulas and lots, lots more. Um, other um, workbenches are driven by universities like Monte Core or uh, commercial tools like uh, MetaEdit Plus. And of course, there are lots of more. Uh, usually, uh, they have uh, one, uh, they target one uh, single tech stack. L lots of examples like, sorry. <laughs> um, like Xtext, uh, Sirius, GMF, and so rely on Java and Eclipse IDE. Others are web-based, like Lang Langium, um, or come within their own standalone tooling. Um, 
in my talk, I don't want to dive into the technical details of these language workbenches, but in general, we want to discuss how to do language engineering with language workbenches from a point of a developer's view. So in the daily work, in the in known uh, software development processes, and also in the long term. And we start um, with looking at activities for DSL development in our daily work. And as you already know, before starting coding, we need to start with an analysis. And in this step, uh, we discuss with our domain experts, with our users. We need to speak with them. We need to know which uh, concerns do we have. You need to investigate which is their actual business. So working with some uh, inappropriate tooling and fighting with Excel tables is probably not the business of your domain experts. Um, so you should know what is their business and what is accidental complexity uh, brought to them by uh, tools. And we want to support them with um, uh, yeah, dedicated tooling, which, is, which are targeted uh, to their objective. So we need to define the objective of the DSLs. And we also should make clear how these uh, DS, uh, how the formalized uh, knowledge is uh, used for the non post processing steps. Let's look at an easy example, which will come to us again. It's a, a known um, domain um, model types, which is an excerpt um, from one of the showcases available. So the intent of the users is to model um, the required data types when they develop information systems. And afterwards, uh, some source code should be generated, uh, which is required later on for the by the programmers. So they want to write something like that when they model an information system for a conference, and they want to model entities for conferences for, for persons and sessions with some data attributes. And some of uh, the users we uh, asked, they said, hmm, maybe I don't want to do it in a textual way, we want to do it in a graphical way. And we see it's also possible to model the same information in a graphical way as well. So, sorry. Um, so the conference uh, we have in textual and in graphical uh, representation, both with the same attributes. When we know that, then I recommend to start with prototyping. And prototyping means that we as developers should uh, uh, give uh, users fast feedback how such a DSL could look like. Usually, you have the problem that uh, when users see directly what they have asked for, then they will say, no, I don't want to have that. I want to have something different. And that's really great, because then they'll see at an example how it should look like, and, and then we know, OK, what should we actually uh, represent. So start with that early. That's good for you and for users as well. Um, so for example, when doing it in a, graphi in a graphical way, uh, you have the uh, definitions for your DSLs. Uh, you change it, you press uh, Save, and then directly uh, the uh, conforming um, diagram is shown to the users. Uh, you, you, you could even uh, do that with such playgrounds um, yeah, in parallel with the users, or you do it one day and, and give the feedback to the users the uh, other days. The other benefit is if your developers are not familiar with the workbench, then it's also a good chance uh, for them to dive into it first or early. So. Uh, prototyping without development is a huge benefit of uh, language workbenches. Or you use a DSL playground, for example, when you want to do it the same in a textual way, uh, you can do that. And uh, to give an example why that's really helpful, we try it out. Um, so I have opened uh, the playground uh, for Langium in the I have no focus at all in the moment. Is it frozen? Uh, OK, that's the problem with live demos.
Okay, great. Now it's speaking with me. Um, so uh, we directly see uh, what uh, this is on the left is the grammar what the developers uh, write down for an early sketch of the language, and we will show this to the user since the user can now uh, type, for example, when they say, okay, we, then they can try it directly uh, because uh, we have also talks in our conference uh, system, um, which might uh, uh, have a name as well. Yo. Uh. No. Thanks a lot. So we have directly completion and we want to have a name here. And that's also great because then you can see that the users forgot something because we see uh, here a conference uh, has a session now, and now the users detect, oh, no, there's some information missing. We want to have multiple sessions. Sometimes we have only one information, so one person for the chair, but we want to have multiple session sessions. That's at the moment not possible to do, so it's great that we discussed that with the users in the prototyping early, So and we can directly say, okay, we need some uh, additional element. We want to uh, mark the properties uh, with a keyword, uh, which, um, which reflects, uh, which indicates that it should be many. And on the fly, we can say many, even with code completion, that we want to have many sessions. That's great that we know it now and not in half a year. Okay. Yeah, we already saw some part of the design for textual DSLs. Uh, in the end, it's um, that we write grammars, um, which uh, formalize which uh, text is allowed to write by users. Um, yeah, and uh, an in-depth talk um, for uh, DSL development, how to make it really specific for your users, is given by my colleague uh, Irina tomorrow in a talk. Uh, something similar uh, counts for graphical DSLs as well. We need to define the types for our domain model first. So again, we see that we have uh, complex and uh, complex and uh, primitive types with properties pointing the types as again. And for the graphical DSLs, we have to specify how they should li look like. So we need to uh, specify the rectangles to see with the different colors. And we need a mapping to say, OK, uh, our complex type should be uh, 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 visualized uh, with a gradient from white to light gray. When it comes to the implementation, um, the Benefits of the uh, workbenches come uh, uh, become much uh, clearly, um, as we already saw in the playground for textual DSLs. For example, with Langium, the user is directly supported with uh, syntax highlighting, auto completion validation, and features much more. What we as a developer later on, in particular when we want to develop the generator, is the AST because the AST reflects the information uh, the user specified without additional, um, with, uh, without concrete syntax, so we get rid of the white spaces and so on. So that means when the user writes uh, his entity for conferences, then we will get a note in our AST, which is in JSON format uh, with the name of the conference, and we'll get also type information that this uh, element should be a complex type, and so on. And that's uh, and this AST is maintained uh, by default by the language workbench, um, which also uh, takes all the contained uh, stuff like tokenizers, parses, indexes, and linkers, and by default we'll get it mainly for free. Um, so it hides a lot of technical details for the developers, and the language workbench has also provided us with the uh, editors uh, to write uh, the grammars, for example. Um, it's quite or it's surprising, similar to graphical DSLs as well. 
uh, the users are supported with visual syntax, with validations, outlines, and other features, so that they can model the diagram. And uh, we, are, as developers, are interested to get some kind of an abstract syntax uh, representing uh, um, the conference. We will see later as a one node in the abstract syntax tree. That's, that's a different format, uh, which is EMF, um, with a tree uh, visualization or an XMI visualization. And again, uh, Sirius, the workbench, uh, maintains the AST for us. And uh, you don't need to implement drag and drop by yourself. That's not fun, but it's fun to reuse it from the language workbench. OK, last step, uh, testing. So quality assurance is quite important. Um, here we see what, you, uh, what the user wrote. The language workbench is uh, responsible for creating the AST. And uh, usually, we start with unit tests. Here, we have the benefit that when we reuse uh, major language workbench, then usually the uh, uh, unit tests are al already done by it. So um, we can concentrate on acceptance tests. We uh, specify what the user wrote, and then we specify how the AST look like, and we can match it to each other. So and uh, uh, so and that makes testing quite easy. Of course, uh, when we find bugs in the language workbench, then maybe we need to go into the details and should submit. Uh, uh, uh a bug request. Um, on the other hand, since we wrote the generator um, by ourselves, it makes sense to write unit tests for complex cases. Um, but again, we can also write acceptance tests, giving the uh, AST as in, and check if, in our case, the generated Java classes are the ones we expect. And if you have really good users who not only know what they are formulating here, but they also know what they expect here, and uh, they uh, face the challenge uh, in the past, you could also ask them to give them uh, to give you these test data and create an acceptance test for the whole chain. Okay. And uh, oh yeah, there is also. Uh, sometimes support by the language workbenches to make the, these kinds of test cases very easy. This is an example for Xtext uh, in order to uh, write acceptance tests like this quite easy and to give an instance in and to check if it's really passable without any errors. After we did all these activities once, so following this waterfall once, we'll get our first DSL. Usually, that's not enough. We are not uh, finished now, and uh, we are interested how to develop bigger DSLs and how to deal with the feedback of users. So we are looking how to develop uh, uh, DSLs in the long term. And the most important stuff is we don't follow the waterfall uh, principle uh, any longer, but usually we have sprints, two hours more or less. Uh, to, no, to Hours, that's quite fast, uh, two weeks more or less. Uh, sometimes even a week, uh, a month is okay, so it, that doesn't care. Important is that we collect feedback from users. Users saying us, okay, there's something missing, uh, something does not work, something is not handy, we understand some keywords not. Other source for uh, feedback are our UI. I experts uh, telling us, okay, the colors you choose, they are not fine for colorblind people and so on. If you don't get any feedback, you have a problem. That means uh, your users don't use your DSL and you have no clue about why. So even when people uh, say or give you well, feedback which is not really valuable or does not make sense, any, uh, it's a chance for you because you know that they use it and you can take it, it as an opportunity to discuss with them how to improve the DSL. Then we can... Uh, then we can uh, f um, do all the activities as before. And 
in order to improve our DSLs, and later on we need to check uh, how these changes in the DSL are uh, applied by the language workbenches. There are in two uh, approaches. Interpreters like uh, Sirius, we configure them, and on the fly the uh, yeah, conforming diagram is interpreted by the, uh, or is derived from the specifications for the DSL. Um, how long the result of Langium we already see in the playground. There's a generator behind it. It was quite fast since it uh, runs in the client only, so in the browser only. Um, and this gives us the opportunity to improve our DSL step by step in iterations. So it even doesn't care uh, if it's really Scrum or a kind of Scrum and so on. That means additionally that our D DSL becomes bigger. And at some point, we'll face a problem that we need some features or the users request something which is not supported by the language workbench by default. So that means you need to um, write custom features with handwritten code. For example, custom validations, which depends on your domain uh, scope, scope, uh, scope calculations does not fit uh, auto completion, should take additional information into account. Or we need some special circuits uh, for our graphical di diagrams, or the user wants to have more interactivity. Um, when we have an interpreter approach, from our language workbench, then we need to check where are the extension points where we can register our handwritten code. So how does it work in general, and also how much do we have for which features? That's important there. If we have a generator approach, that means we have uh, handwritten code and we have generated code, and both have to work together. The um, important question is how does it work? And uh, it's important, as you all know, counts here as well, generated code must be uh, un unchanged, keep it unchanged, and separated from, uh, from your handwritten code. Otherwise, if you mix it, you'll get directly into a maintenance problem. And please investigate your workbench, how it's done there. Um, at some point, scalability comes up. Um, so we have lots of files involved, so at some point when users write textual DSLs and it's uh, too big, uh, with thousand uh, lines of code, then you want to have some kind of modularization, splitting up. The same counts for the grammar definitions, um, and uh, even diagrams can be become too big, and we had a presentation about that uh, today already uh, in the application of Sproti. Um, Another important question is performance, uh, rendering, and so on of big uh, DSLs. Mm. And uh, since DSLs are not a standalone tools, uh, it's important to check how we can integrate them into our uh, environment. So um, um, for textual DSLs, it's quite uh, nice when they support the language server protocol because then you can embed them into uh, any t uh, editor which supports the LSP pro protocol. Okay, when we use uh, language workbenches a lot, then we somehow depend on them. So we have the question regarding costs of language workbenches. Uh, so typical problems like vendor lock-ins, license fees. We at EclipseCon, we know open source is often a very good answer to that problem. Um, but we should also look on who is developing and maintaining the development, uh, the language workbench itself. So is it one company? Are there multiple companies? Uh, is it, is it uh, university driven? How big is the community uh, with contributions and so on? Uh, that, uh, depa that has influence on the maintenance of the language uh, workbench itself. The same counts for the question when you have a problem with your DSL, uh, where can you get support by companies, communities, and so on. Um, then, uh, final problem, over time, uh, your system environment uh, uh, is uh, might influence by some technical changes. Technical sta is, uh, stacks are uh, changed. For example, at some time uh, in our ongoing example, we might not be happy about the generated Java anymore, since we need the data classes uh, for a new business logic written in vector technology. So we need Java uh, TypeScript. 
the great thing with this approach is that we can uh, create a new generator providing the new data we need. And uh, for migration strategies, uh, we can even um, deploy both generators in parallel because they uh, uh, rely on the same unchanged uh, AST and editor framework. So um, if uh, such changes uh, arise in your in, uh, environment and you are happy that you can uh, keep uh, the editor so that you don't need uh, or can embed it with a language server or protocol into some other techniques, it's often enough to keep the DSL uh, unchanged, but replace your generator or add additional uh, generators to it. So that's a big benefit by separating the users and the technical stuff behind that uh, with uh, your DSL, because the users focus on formalizing their knowledge in a dedicated language. Okay, to, to summarize then, uh, sum up, we saw uh, lots of activities uh, how to develop uh, DSLs in your daily work, and in particular with emphasizing the prototyping to get fast feedback, which is also the main ideas of, uh, of uh, Scrum, for example. Here you are somehow forced because you are directly uh, uh, working for users and their needs with a DSL. And we also saw how to uh, work with language engineers in a long term. So you see, in particular, with prototyping, it's quite easy to dive into language engineering as a developer. So I motivate you to just start uh, developing DSLs. And now I'm happy to answer your questions just now or later at our booth uh, on the upper floor. Questions? Please. So, um, I, I've been working with Xtext quite some years ago. Great. Uh, as I saw Lang Langium, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, is pre but what, what kind of types of um, restrictions do I have? So, what kinds of languages can, are unable to be expressed with that grammar? Um, is it can I do everything that I was able to do with Xtext, or can I do less or more? Uh, Using Armclar and the back, or how, how does it work? Uh, so the main principles of Xtext are. Sorry? Oh, yeah. So the question is uh, a comparison of Xtext to Langium. Um, yeah, it's not a dedicated language, uh, neither dedicated uh, Xtext talk, um, but yeah, we at TypeScript, at uh, TypeFox, uh, developed uh, Langium um, in order to support uh, the web stack. So it's implemented with TypeScript, and the idea is to have mainly the same uh, principles as for Xtext. Uh, some slightly improvements uh, for the grammar definitions are done. Um, there's also somehow a back compatibility for it, how to define uh, um, uh, non-terminal, uh, terminal, sorry. Um, so mainly the limitations are the same. The in-depth, I think we support a bit more, right, Mark? Um, maybe you can, a bit more. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so maybe we can discuss that with Mark later on. Okay, great. Other questions? Okay, then thanks uh, again, and uh, le let's continue discussing, and please start uh, developing uh, DSLs.